one. Uh, great. Hi there. Uh, I'm Michael Kowalski. I'm the uh, founder of Contentment, kind of UK-based app publishing platform. Uh, and I'm going to talk about intimacy. So I um, thought it'd be able to get this out the way to start with. I think we spend far too much time talking about uh, fiction and narrative text at these, at, the, at these kinds of events. That stuff's easy, actually. You know, I think there's, there's, there's much harder forms of published content around that um, have more difficult problems to solve. That's what interests me. So um, everyone seems to be throwing in pictures of old kit from Gutenberg or whatever. I thought I would say, this is the IBM uh, 1620, which is the first uh, computer I ever used. Uh, and the way you programmed it was by, you know, with your pencil, you'd punch little holes in the punch card and feed them into the hopper. Um, I feel obliged to say that I'm not really as old as all that. Um, I was in New Zealand at the time. It's a, it, <laughs> It's a sort of time travel. Okay, but you know, um, actually the 1620 um, was relatively compact compared with a lot of kind of mainframe devices that are around certainly earlier. That you know, these huge machines initially that you never saw, they're off in another room somewhere in the server room and you'd be working at a dumb terminal. But Moore's Law did its work, you know, um, and they kind of got smaller and nearer to us. We had the desktop revolution, we went to laptops, uh, and, and you know, here we are now in mobile, that we've got um, these small devices that are on us pretty much all the time and, and that are often is not switched on as well, that we have this kind of, we're using them at home, we're using them at work, we're using them in transit, using them everywhere. Um, and I think when this started, and certainly when I set up to do a business that was dealing with mobile publishing, I, I think there were a number of assumptions we had um, that... Uh, really maybe didn't think about too much at the time. One was, for any of us who'd worked on the web, it kind of looked like, okay, it's just basically another, the design problem is that it's another screen size. And we're, okay, it's gonna be tricky squishing our content in, but that's the main problem. Um, and then we thought also nobody would read long stuff on a phone. Uh, you, you know, it, it's just, be, would be ridiculous, right? Um, and thirdly, and I think this was partly, you know, those of us who had put a load of effort and passion and hope into the web, you know, it, looked a bit askance at apps and kind of maybe hoped that they would go away, that they were, it was just a little thing, you know. Um, these were all wrong, of course. Uh, you know, all, these, all these, these kinds of ideas were wrong. The thing about um, that, that the, the kind of ubiquity, propinquity, the fact that you've always got your device on you has really made, made a sea change in the way people consume content. I don't know if you can kind of read this here. This is from a recent report put out by uh, Digiday. So the the, the purple bit is basically the percentage of the day that you're spending doing communication and consuming media and so on. I mean, increasingly, that is actually what we do. You know, if you want to cook up one of these little definitions of what humans are, we are people who consume media, it turns out. So that's a kind of massive opportunity for uh, publishers, really. It's like, um, you know, we've all, we've all kind of seen this. Uh, it's like this huge ice shelf of attention has melted, you know, the global, the global level of attention has gone up and that, and that, you know, if you're in that game and publishers are, that's pretty exciting, there's, a, there's, there's kind of a lot of opportunity around that. So um, what are the differences? So that's one of the big differences is, is always with us, you know, nearly always on that kind of pattern of intermittent uh, persistent connectivity. Another thing is that this, this touch base inter interface was introduced. Uh, with mobile devices, and that removed a kind of layer of abstraction, you know, in a way now when you look at a desktop system, it's like something with, you know, pulleys and levers, you know, it's like, it's, I'm moving this thing over here and something's happening over there, you know. With, with, a, with a mobile, I have this much more intimate connection with what I'm doing. It's, it's direct manipulation, I'm touching it and it's responding to my touch. It's, I, I think that has given us a much more kind of emotional connection to our devices than we ever had before with um, desktops and so on. Also, uh, another striking thing about mobile was these kind of huge constraints, you know, um, these tiny little screens, um, uh, these big fat fingers, much cruder pointing device than we had previously. Uh, it also has to fit onto this little screen, you know, and a kind of limited range of gestures, no, you know, mouse over or hover or any of this kind of stuff or right click, you know. Actually, sort of looks like a bit of a kind of clusterfuck from a UI uh, perspective, but, but it turned out to be a blessing in disguise. This is fantastic. 
I mean, what, what this really did was force the pace on user-centered design. It meant that because we were operating within these tight constraints, it, you know, it's kind of like an organism growing up in an oxygen-deprived environment or something, you know. It's, like, it's got to focus, it's got to evolve. And what we had to evolve towards was simplicity, like doing one thing at a time and doing it well, kind of much simpler user journeys, getting rid of all that cruft that we'd build up on the web, all that navigational cruft and all that sort of stuff, you know. Um, and actually, Apple did a, a few things, I think, that really helped with this. One was they set some kind of quality threshold with the review process, much as developers hate it, you know. Um, it, 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 it's, it's there, that was a kind of level. With iOS, they brought a lot of ideas that have been kind of kicking around in um, uh, interaction design circles for ages. They kind of actually brought them into a kind of consumer-facing mainstream environment. Um, and... Uh, you know, finally, they, you know, they reward good design in the App Store. Getting, it's, it's a very small shop front, but if you get promoted to the top, the, re the rewards for that are great. So, you know, I think they help kind of push this forward, this kind of shift towards thinking more about the quality of design. And, and you know, what we have seen is a, a big kind of rise in the, in, the, in the quality of consumer software interfaces on mobile. Um, you know, to the extent that, actually, nobody thinks of them as computers anymore. You know, you, nobody thinks they have a computer in their pocket. Um, that, that uh, you know, our, our mobile devices are more like appliances than our computers ever were. I mean, you look at, look at a home screen, what is it? It's kind of a set of buttons. They're buttons, and we tap one of those buttons, and it does something for us. It's, it's, it, it, we've kind of shifted a whole level of stuff to the hardware, if you like, that the, the, that... The, the hardware is, has become an appliance and the apps are sort of buttons inside that that, that uh, call forth various activities, these kind of simple user journeys. Uh, Jim Barksdale, ex-CEO of uh, Netscape and a, a, a VC now, I think, who's had many great quotes, not, some of them contradictory probably. This is one of the things he said, you know, uh, two ways to make money in business, bundling and unbundling. Well, you know, in the mobile space, it's all about unbundling. It's about taking the complex propositions and breaking out the kind of simpler things that we can do with them. Uh, at this from Mary Mika's uh, Internet Trends report earlier in the year, you know, and we've seen the evolution of this even in mobile, that um, initially uh, software being launched, like just porting the web model over into these big complex apps and then realizing that wasn't really working and breaking them out into kind of smaller apps, this kind of unbundling. So where does that leave the web? Well, you know, web browser is probably one of the crappiest apps on your mobile. It's got this kind of complicated interaction. You don't, navigation, um, you don't really know what's going to happen when you touch anything. You don't know where you're going to go. Um, quite often it will be something unreadable. Um, and, and unsurprisingly, um, you, you know, just pure web usage on a phone is much lower than it is on desktop. Uh, at this point, you know, when I was writing it, I was thinking, hey, maybe Peter has invited me here in a kind of wicker man kind of way, um, that I'm the heretic in the room, you know, where are the browsers, man, you know, uh, uh, where are the books even? Um, so I should say, you know, it, it's not that the web, or at least the internet, has gone away. Of course, that is a, this is a kind of level underneath the apps. We're using it for lots of things, certainly absolutely critical for sharing and discovery and uh, things like that, but also, you know, a lot of services, data services, storage services, etc. Uh, but that is, has, again, has kind of been abstracted away from where the user has to think about it. And the way that we no longer have to think about how we install software, like we don't have to download a DMG and then double click it and then drag something, you know, it's, it's just all kind of magically happens for us. And the web has become this infrastructure layer uh, in, the, in the app ecosystem. So, with all these ideas in place, um, I set out to build a platform for publishing to mobile. I take it as a kind of self-evident truth, I hope you all do too, that HTML is the only thing that makes any sense for, um, uh, uh, you know, portable content. Uh, or Markdown maybe, I don't know. Uh, not for my kind of content. Um, and uh, I'm not actually going to talk about this much. I'm not going to talk about responsive design. You all know what responsive design is, I guess. And it, it's, it's a thing that we need to do if we're going to publish to a con continually multiplying range of um, devices. Now, there's a kind of naive way to deal with this problem, um, uh, w w the content management way. The way it works, you, you're probably all familiar with this. You, you have a kind of schema that defines your content. You have... Um, a content repository that will hold content mapping to that schema. You have a UI that maps to that schema that pushes content into 
uh, the repository, and then you feed that out through templates to as many different target devices as you like. Sweet. Um, actually, it's deeply flawed. I think it's got a number of very serious problems. One is, you know, no one actually wants to author in your new UI. You know, they're going to use Word or they're going to use whatever they've already got, and then they're going to paste it in. So there's a kind of missing step there, which is the copy and paste bit, right? That's actually quite time-consuming and tedious. Um, and, you know, to be honest, not only um, people don't like schemas, but content doesn't much like them either. Content is not data. Um, a, a lot of content doesn't fit very nicely to schemas. And in fact, most content holding schemas have big blobs of HTML somewhere in the middle of them that kind of hide that problem. And finally, there's this kind of template bit. You know, I, this idea, we, we've kind of re completely reversed what we have traditionally done in print. We're no longer designing around our content. We're doing the design up front. Some developers are doing the design up front. And then we're squirting our con content through it and seeing what sprays out. You know, I think it's a really limited approach. I mean, all the kind of craft of uh, content design that was earned so hard over so many decades, you know, do we just throw that? Does that really have no value? Do we throw that away? I don't think so. So design is done too soon. Templates are also quite expensive to build, generally. Um, you'll keep hitting edge cases. You keep finding the content doesn't fit them. You've got to crank out some more templates, et cetera, et cetera. So I don't think that's a really great approach, and that was not the approach that I wanted to use with our platform. Um, and I, I, one of my gurus is Jeff Raskin, a guy who uh, well, did many kind of interesting things, but he also wrote this book, The Humane Interface, which I love. I think it's a great book. I recommend you read it. Um, I wanted to build something that had a humane workflow to it, that was kind of respecting the, you know, the people who had to do the work, who were, who were putting in, you know, creating content or doing publishing. The basic system we came up with is, I'm, you know, I'm not going to go into any of this in any detail, that we automate what we can automate. So no, no copy and paste, so it's all kind of Dropbox sync and importer apps and automatic conversion, auto-tuning, whatever we can do to get content to a place where a human can step in and do creative things with it and do the kind of interesting bits. Oh, right, I better speed up. Um, so I've got just some interfaces. I'll Send this around later. We do a lot of cardified based stuff, so a lot of content chunked into cards. Cards have responsive design, practical workflow built into them, and so on. And visual layout tools. And this all goes out into hybrid apps, so that's a kind of native wrapper app into which HTML content goes. You can have different apps for different uh, platforms. Um, and I think when apps started, nobody really knew how the reading experience would work. There was a kind of ridiculous instructions on how to use. Um, over time, this pattern has emerged as a kind of simple swipe left and right to explore the content, scroll down to engage with it. Anything more complicated, like shifting context, just goes off into a completely different view. It's, it's something invoked typically by a hamburger. Um, and there's lots of interesting things that you can do um, with interaction. Initially, mostly just gimmickry in apps. Now, actually, we've seen the use cases. Um, architecture of choice being one of them, various kind of filtering mechanisms. Using things like animations to show the user journey with your fat fingers, it's easy to press the wrong thing. That kind of makes it clearer um, if we can animate transitions. One thing we did find is that um, a lot of print designers find this difficult. Um, they want to fit things. They want to break the tools to try and do things the way they're used to. So there's a kind of training and learning step to all this. Um, weren't sure who the customers were going to be for us. It's turned out to be magazines in the short term, and I think that's just about where the market is. The fact that uh, magazines are facing an even stiffer existential crisis than other branches are publishing at the moment. But that turned out to be quite a good thing because they actually have really hard content. You know, it's complex, it comes out of InDesign files, it's, um, it's not very semantic, etc., and it needs these kind of rich layouts as well. So, in a way, it's a kind of great proving ground for what we're doing to deal with this kind of stuff. But just porting those magazines over didn't seem like a good idea. Um, a lot of other types of apps have really changed when they got to mobile. If you look at the games on mobile versus console games, completely different type of experience, and one that has you know, expanded the consumer base. Certainly we thought, you, know, you tap on this button, what happens? If it's a traditional magazine app, what happens is you get a list of back issues. And you tap it again tomorrow, you get the same, and then the next day, and the same, and the same, and then once a month, you get and you, you get some change. So obviously, if you move to a weekly model or to a continuous model, it fits a lot better with the, um, the way that people are using their devices on the train platform, cranking it up, see if there's anything there. there maybe there's going to be something there if, you, if, if we have these more kind of continuous models. One we did this with recently, this is a, a kind of seasonal magazine that we've published with Nesta, who are an innovation charity in the UK, designed by Mark Porter, who's a, a, a quite well-known newspaper um, designer. 
Um, and it, it, it trickles out stories. It, it has a change of season every couple of months and trickles out stories, a mix of short stories and long stories um, over the course of uh, the month. I think it's a, it's a kind of great model, and I think we're going to be doing a lot more of that kind of stuff. Um, there's another one which is kind of taking craft content. So this is about um, unbundling content, if you like, looking at the back catalog of a crafts publisher, pulling out the patterns and putting them into an app and selling them through an app purchase. Uh, and ditto. Do, do you guys have 5.2 diet here? There's, do you know what that is? Yeah, it's pretty grim. Um, I hope no one's on their five day here today. So this, this again, this is from a women's consumer magazine and it's pulling out the recipes and making uh, an app out of them again with bundles of additional content kind of being sold through that. So next for us, well, we're going to do a lot of stuff about data and infographics for various business publishers that we've got, um, which will be interesting. But also we've just been um, granted a bit of money from some UK quango to um, explore children's content in this space, which I'm sort of relishing uh, and also slightly fearful of because it is the absolute most complex type of content there is, I think. Um, children's magazines are just batshit crazy. Um, but that's going to be fun. Um, and I think also we've got to keep an eye on wearables now, you know, I mean, I know they kind of, they look ridiculous and Google Glass maybe isn't it, but there's the risk of us making the same mistake we made with um, mobile, thinking that um, nobody's going to read on, you know, their glasses or whatever. Actually, they probably are, and this constant movement, this kind of more little evolution of our devices becoming more pervasive, always on, closer to us, you know, probably part of us eventually, um, is something that we have to take into account. And finally, let's bring it back to books. So um, I think there's huge scope for um, non-fiction book publishers to think about this stuff carefully. That there, I think there's a real opportunity here. You can look at the lessons of, of what magazine publishers are doing, and there's useful stuff there that I think can be done with uh, non-fiction content. Thinking about these appliance-like, always-on experiences, you know, how can we continuously publish content? So when we push that button, something happens, something kind of interesting, something that I care about. Okay, so yeah, adventurous publishers sort as well. Yeah. Okay, thanks. talks or as um, um, Mr. Maxwell said, but I agree with both. So why is So I, I think it's, it's okay. So at its, at its core, the interesting thing about this is I'm, I agreed with everything you said, basically. Um, and for me, I don't want to write HTML5 by hand, right? Mm -hmm. And so Markdown is this way of producing, like, like the, the, if you think about the, you know, targeting mobile, like both of us are emphasizing how important mobile is, right? And for me, we're in the book business. And so you know, we're emphasizing, hey, write in Markdown, click a button, book exists magically, looks good on all formats, done, mm -hmm. right? But you're saying, like, we take HTML5 content and make it look awesome in mobile and other places. But they had the same sort of idea about... Yeah, I guess. I mean, I, 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 gotta, I don't want to get yeah, into yeah. an argument. No, <laughs> yeah, arguments, right. are, arguments are fun. Yeah. I People, think, uh, you know, for me, Markdown is a code. If your audience, if your uh, publishing audience, your, your writers, whatever, are developers, that's going to work really well. If mm. there are anybody else, you know... No, uh, you okay, know. So, so John Gruber made it for bloggers, not coders. Yeah. So it's, it's like if you could write a blog, if you're smart enough to write a blog, you're smart enough to learn Markdown. I think, I, I think at that point, though, it was um, the least worst option just because all the WYSIWYG stuff was so terrible. And that was a failure of those of us who were writing WYSIWYG stuff. We should have done a better job. Right, but is there any good WYSIWYG thing now? Yeah, sure, you can do it. <laughs> well, I mean, I can make one, but... Yeah, quite, yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, the funny thing is, who's, like, tiny MCE, right? That's terrible. But that's, like, half the internet puts tiny MCE and embeds it in some crappy web page and that's what you get, right? And so we, it was funny, when we started LeanPub, we actually, we really believe in iterating and so we used, we actually forked WordPress MU just as a quick way of getting to market and we had like you writing inside tiny MCE and it was like, no one wanted that and I really, you know, we woke up one day and I'm like, I don't want to use my own product, right? And so we found people have their own tools. Word, mostly. <laughs> some people. The, the funny thing, it's amazing actually how something that's existed for 20, 25 years is considered like a, a law of physics. Like the idea of like, but you have to use Word. It's like, because there's gravity and oxygen in Microsoft Word, right? I mean, it's like, no, people have been writing a lot longer than Word existed, right? 
And at some point, word might not, not exist, and I don't think it'll be missed. You know, for most of my uh, customers actually, I mean, some of them have got APIs, great if they do or whatever, but for most of them it's InDesign. Right. And weirdly, I would say the biggest exactly. part of our product, the thing we spent the most effort on, is almost invisible. It's the bit about cleaning up InDesign content. Okay, it actually, and this is actually it. really interesting because we, what, at LeanPub we spew InDesign out. Like, so we make, like, so for us, it's like write, publish, in progress, right? Like, you're writing, click publish, write, click publish, et cetera. And when you're done, you know, besides the PDF, EPUB, Mobi, and HTML, you can also click the Generate InDesign button, and we make trashy InDesign, <laughs> right? Well, simple InDesign, which then, if you're an InDesign person, you can take and make a really good product out of, right? I'm sure your InDesign is like 10 times better than ours. Yeah. But, but our content is 10 times simpler, yeah. right? So layout should be done in InDesign, is our take on it, for print. Yeah, but you know, I mean, if, Obviously, for a lot of publishers, print is still a big part of what they're doing. Right. And it's where the, you know, just in terms of real workflow, obviously, you've got to work with the workflow people have got. I, I, I think not that many publishers are, are ready to go to look at going to some sort of digital first right. well, workflow. Yeah, so I think the tech publishers sort of got pushed there because um, if you're writing about computer stuff, everything gets obsolete so quickly mm -hmm. that if you don't publish in progress, your like, meaningful lifespan of your book has been chopped in half. Um, but like, I mean, we think print's important, like, but like, we think that print, print is only important for finished books, right? Not in progress books. And print layout should be done using print layout tools, not done using things authors use. Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, in the magazine, as I said, one of the advantages of working with them is it's hard. And one right. of the things that's hard is they're kind of ridiculous deadlines. Like, we do weekly magazine titles where yeah, every okay. page is handcrafted. And, you know, they, they're doing it on a weekly basis. And our bit, they have to be able to do that in three hours, two hours, three hours. Oh, you know, right. so. Yeah, well, yeah, that's totally orthogonal. So yeah, yeah. You, what you're doing is, yeah. So. Have any of you guys got questions? Or? Yeah, <laughs> just we stand here all day. <laughs> okay, one question. <laughs> Bingo. Well, I actually, that's... We should join we, up. <laughs> we create InDesign as an output. Yeah, we create InDesign as an output. I'm not sure... Do you take InDesign as an input? Yeah. There you go. You could write in LeanPub, click the Jerry InDesign button, and then put it into your stuff, and you can fix it. <laughs> um, so, our, so for us, we're focused on making the author's life as easy as possible, right? For, in pro for if you're publishing a book while you're writing it, we want as publishing as easy as click the publish button. And then what you get out of that is a book that looks decent. If you want the book to look amazing, that will require design skill and complicated tools. But you shouldn't be using those while you're writing. You should be using them when you're done if it warrants making a print book. But that, we're not trying to be in every business, right? That's not our business. We just export and design and say, have fun. I think there's still a lot of space for kind of rich content experiences even on mobile, you know, and stuff that looks great and stuff that we just don't throw away all that long history of great design that, um, you know, we, we've, we've learned over such a long period of time. Thank you. Thanks. All right, so break time again. Dessert is on offing. Um, relative